What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Dragzine Podcast. I'm your host, Senior Editor Brian Wagner, and this week I have put myself out there to the fires of chaos. I have Farm Truck and Asian on the show. What's going on, guys? What's up? What's up, man? Good to see you. Good to see you guys as well. It's uh, it's been a crazy couple years with everything going on. And you guys, you know, I, I've I've had you guys on my list to have on the show for a while just for the sheer fact that you are probably two of the most entertaining people I've ever seen at a racetrack. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, it, I think it pays off to have a good time. You know, you, you can't fake fun, you know, especially for an extended period of time. So uh, we, we've had a good time. This has been a fun ride. Uh, it just seems to keep going. So uh, anytime you see us having a good time, it's, it, it's, it, it's true. That's who we are. Yeah, it, it shows. Like that, that's one of the cool things about being a media person is I get to be the fly on the wall. And you see some people, and you know, there's I I put it that you know there's the way they are on stage and the way they are you know behind the scenes. You guys always seem like you're on the chip, ready to rip at all times, and it's amazing. <laughs> I like that. It's it's true, man. We're it, it, we're always on the edge of trying to figure out where this experience is at. There's always an experience in something, right? We're we're trying to figure out how things work in this world, and uh, we never figure it out. But that's the fun. Of it. I, I think one of the funniest things I've ever seen you guys do, specifically you, Asian, is when you uh at the Norwalk No Prep Kings deal where you uh commandeered a piece of track equipment started riding off <laughs> i remember that like i'm watching this from the tower and i'm like oh this is fantastic like, <laughs> it was so funny for them to all of a sudden realize what was going on <laughs> kind of what's the story behind that you know what, man, any chance we can get when we see that a, a set of keys are in a vehicle or somebody has left something running, there's nothing funnier to us than stealing it. <laughs> <laughs> right. So just it, keep, it's in our DNA. Yeah. You know, just, it's what we do. Just keep in mind that whatever we're doing, you know, we're best friends. So I'm trying to make him laugh. He's <laughs> trying to make me laugh. And so that's the first point of contact for all of us. So I don't know there's a world around me when I'm doing that kind of stuff. And so I'm trying to make farm truck laugh at the time. And hey, if anyone else enjoys that process, cool. But not to worry, everyone gets their vehicles back. <laughs> they may be broken when they get them back, but they will get them back. <laughs> you say broken, I say enhancements. You know, it's like, <laughs> the minutia, well, right? No, I say broken, but you know, there's always when something's broke, you, that's an opportunity to upgrade. So. <laughs> oh yeah, my wife is terrified when she sees me looking at something kind of cock my head like a German Shepherd. She's like. Oh, no, no, we're not modifying this. We're not modifying this. <laughs> like, well, why not? You know, what what, what could go wrong? And then it's she wrote out the list of what's gone wrong. I'm like, yeah, good point. <laughs> <laughs> you got to do that sometimes, right? Like, you just got to take someone's vehicle and, and, and take it for a spin. Yeah, yeah. Bring it back mostly with all the rubber on the tires and, you know, right. and not puke and cool it, right? True. Now, Farm Truck, you know, we got Asian where he's trying to make you laugh. Has there been a point where you've done something a little off the wall to try to, like, get a rise out of him? I've seen some some shenanigans with high-powered golf carts at Outlaw Armageddon before. You know, what, what are some other stuff we might have seen or might not have seen? Um, you know, we're constantly looking, uh, like Asian said, to make each other laugh. Uh, you know, and it's on a daily, uh, an hourly, by-the-minute basis. <laughs> yeah. So I couldn't possibly remember uh, you know, uh, hardly any of the things that we do because that's actually our goal in life. Yeah. You know? Let's uh, make, try to make each other laugh and have a good time. Yeah. I think that a lot of people are like, oh man, you know, most people, they run through their lives and they remember the pranks they have. We're not really pranksters, right? Like a lot of people think that we're pranksters and we're not, uh, our jokes just come across as pranks because we're just, it's an attempt to make each other laugh, right? Uh, whatever that is. And Hey, even if it's, you know, at the expense of others, you know, having to try and figure out why the heck we're doing what we're doing. Uh, but now nah, we don't, we don't have mile markers for what we do in life. We just kind of go hour by hour, minute by minute and um, do our best to, to make the most of it. I was going to say, if you guys were trying to do prank wars on each other, the tally marks would have been in the millions by now. Sure. Man, I, oh, we'd have killed each yeah, other by now. That's, that's yeah, correct. Yeah. He'd be dead. <laughs> It'd be spy yeah. versus spy, you know. <laughs> you got to find that line. And that, that's the problem I've had with friends before is like, you know, th there's that line that some people are willing to cross and others aren't willing to cross. And in, you know, the, the world where you live in a high horsepower, crazy fun, that can get kind of gnarly in a hurry. So you got to definitely kind of, you know, ha have a hard ceiling. Yeah, it's it's true. We know we know our limits. 
awesome. Now, you know, Street Outlaws is one of the biggest shows on TV. You absolutely can't deny that. And that's just amazing to, you know, kind of looking back on all of this, you know, I've, I've talked to other guys from the show. What was your guys' moment when you kind of realized, wow, this is, this is kind of a big thing. It's a big thing. It, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> it is. Telling us it's a big thing. I didn't know it was. Um, you know, I guess it, it's hard to pinpoint it, but right out at the top of my head, when they started integrating our show into other reality shows, once we started uh, meeting the other cast members of all these other shows that we've been watching, while all the while we didn't get our own show, right? You know, there was Fast and Loud. There's, you know, uh, Misfit Garage. There's, um, you, you know, meet, meeting... Um, Mike Rowe from Dirty Jump, we, we, uh, the, uh, the the Gold Rush guys, right? Like meeting. Once when they started integrating us into other shows, I, I began to realize we live in a reality outside of regular reality, right? And we, we get to experience some things that eh, probably the, the, the regular Joe, the average Joe won't get to experience. That's probably the moment we realized, okay, th this is bigger than ourselves and we'll never fully understand it. You know, uh, when we did Bristol, um, uh, Asian and I, we were late getting to the starting line and there were 40,000 fans there and we walked up and uh, every fan there was on their feet cheering for us. Uh, that blew me away, gave me chills. Uh, and that was a moment where I was like, wow, um, this is a lot bigger than I ever thought it was. Uh, all those Bristol fans were amazing people. And for all of them to get on their feet like that, it, it blew us away. We couldn't believe it. And it's, it's cool that you can tell you guys are still humble about this and you enjoy it. It's like, you're like, you're like me, you're like a fan that's getting to live the dream. And every day you're like, wait, I get, I get paid to do this. Sweet. Yeah. Right. It's but, true. but you know, it was never a dream. It just happened. You know, <laughs> we never, we never thought, you know, that this was going to happen to us. And when it did happen, um, yeah, it, it just takes a while for your brain to catch up with what actually is happening. So, yeah, that, that's true. It's it's always undeserving. Right. Because a dream, you catch the dream. That's you can right. make the dream happen. Oh, I deserve this. I've worked for this dream. I've I've made this happen. Of course it exists. I created it. Right. Whereas this the majority of what's happened to us has been circumstantial and been just kind of a, a blessing for us to be able to um, to integrate it into our lives. And again, you, you take it a step further. You mentioned you've been on other people's shows and then, you know, Discovery comes to you say, hey, we're going to give you your own show. What was that moment like? Was that like the total mind melt moment? It's like, wow, this this is now like, wow. It was totally a wow moment. And we were immediately like, what? No, we're not <laughs> yeah. going to do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, although there has been a lot of talk about um, among the film crew about the Farm Truck and Asian show for a long time. But whenever it was coming uh, to materialize, um, it, it was hard to believe, you know, that they wanted us to do that. I, I could only imagine like in these production meetings, you guys were coming up all these big, crazy ideas and like, the, the, you know, Sam and the guys are probably looking at it going, oh, what if, why have we given these, the, the inmates, the keys to <laughs> yeah. the asylum? Yeah. <laughs> well, um, you know, that was kind of one of the conditions that we got to build whatever we wanted to build. Um, and no one knew how long it was going to take. Uh, and it took an awfully long, long time to do, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, a farm boat. Uh, you know, you can't Google the instructions on how to build a farm boat. Um, and, you know, most people in production were used to the common four to six weeks on putting a car together. It took us a lot longer to build these one off things. And I think that was a surprise for them. Uh, we had no idea how long it was going to take, but we knew that it was going to take a lot longer than four to six weeks. And again, it, it's like the, uh, I, I joked there, the circle of chaos, the positive chaos that you guys produce is just, it's amazing to watch. It, it gets, and I can't wait to see the show, to see this, this hurricane expand, because I think, I think it's going to be amazing. And that kind of parlays into the next thing I want to talk about is, you know, Street Outlaws has, I use the word passionate fans. I use that phrase very uh, loosely because some of them are borderline psychotic, which is not a yeah. bad thing to have. 
it's awesome to see again being on the outside looking in, seeing at the no prep king events and you know pri that like your guys's fans are just infatuated with you and that's amazing to see what are some of the more memorable fan interactions you've had over the years? We talked to Scott Taylor and there was a, uh, there was a mention of a, a, a woman wanting her certain part of anatomy assigned, which is uh, definitely an interesting one for him. But, you know, what are some of your fan interactions you've been through? You know, I mean, quite honestly, hey, there's there's always the ones that want us to sign something uh, a little more intimate. Uh, we we keep it a hard PG-13 as well. That's right. Uh, last thing we need is a picture on the Internet floating around of something at a, at a weird angle. Right. Like and so, you know, really for us, um, the surprise fan interactions are the ones that are emotionally invested. Right. And I know that's not as fun and that's not as uh, exciting to talk about. But for me, the ones I remember the most are the ones that. are are the are the fans that say that we made the most impact in in their lives and made them want to do something different that's right um you know yeah there's fun ones there's funny ones there's there there, there's there's you know uh beautiful ladies that come up unexpectedly and and at there's but but for us the memorable ones are the ones that that they say that we we've changed our their lives and some that's right the father and son uh that come up and they say you know we were there was nothing on tv to watch we stumbled across your show for the first time. And after that, one of them said to the other, you know, we do have that old truck out back. They went out back and it's on the road now. Uh, that those are the stories that, uh, that are really touch us, you know, that we might've brought a family together, uh, totally unintentional, you know, that stuff, when we hear those stories, it just blows us away. Yeah. And that, that keeps us, that's what actually motivates us more is that, is that not that we're funny or that we thought that somebody thought we were funny or that we thought a fan was being funny. Those are very temporary fleeting moments in life. Right. And you need a lot of those all the time, every day, every hour, but the ones that will stick with you are the ones where you, you may have changed someone's life. Oh, it, that, that's awesome to hear that. Like, uh, like I said, I've seen some of the interactions, but to see that those are the ones that really impact you guys, I think that kind of, again, ties it back to how big the show is and the positive impact that all of the Street Outlaw guys have been able to have. Because I've seen, you know, I joke, Ryan Martin sat outside his trailer at, at National Trail Raceway and signed autographs for literally until Javi was like, dude, get in the car. We got to make a hit. And he's like trying to sign someone's baby as he's built into the car. That dude will sign <laughs> yeah. anything. It's amazing to like, you don't see that in motorsports these days. You just, you don't. Gotcha. gotcha. Well, I don't think they allow that. I think, you know, we've been to uh, an NHRA event. We've been to NASCAR events and they usher those guys in, they usher them out. Right. And they don't allow them, you know, even the, mo- the monster truck guys are the closest thing probably to that, that they can get out of their truck and really further interact. But Hey, they have agents, they have, uh, they have PR people that they need to be somewhere. They have a schedule. Um, I think that we we've been kind of we've been grateful that we haven't had that schedule, right? We haven't had, and that's really what separates an HRA from from No Prep King, Street Outlaws, right? And there's there's a divide there. There's the uh, the, the ability, the access to us is the major difference. Oh, totally. Like I, I guess the best way to put it, you guys roam around like free range chickens. There's no handlers. You're just doing whatever you <laughs> have. <laughs> you know, yeah. you, you don't see a lot. Like rarely do you see some of the biggest names in motorsports not walking around with a shadow of someone around them. Which it's I guess you know we got to throw that word around professional. You know yeah, they you they, do, they, yeah. they need to have that. It's it's a different deal and it's different. I, I get the float between all these different worlds and like the outlaw style of racing, you know, like with no prep radio racing, stuff like that. Like you can walk into these dudes pits and practically touch cars. It's a yeah. different experience. I think it, I think it leads to that. I, I think everything eventually leads to that, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. I, like you, you use the word handler. These, these people in these professional, these professional drivers, they have a schedule. They have to make a quota. They have uh, they have to be somewhere. They have uh, you know the, time is money in that in that world, right? That we can't see. We can't see that money. Whereas us, we just go drag racing, right? Like they, they've let us kind of do what we want to do. We still have to. Ryan Martin still had to get buckled in the seat, right? So there's a very gl- slight glimpse of Javi being his mechanic, his tune and his handler, right. Telling him we got to get in the car and race. There's no difference in that between the guy ushering, you know, Joey Logano to his car or getting him out of his car. There's just a lot more structure. And that structure has never really reached the outlaws. 
No, and I, you know, kind of looking at that too, is is that something that kind of with the new show that you guys had that ability to not have your typical, like, we'll call it the street outlaws formula structure where it's like, you know what, let's just let these guys run wild. Sure. Yeah, it was. Yeah, they, they did. Well, they let us build whatever we wanted. Um, but, you know, we ran into the same problem that the rest of the world did, COVID. Uh, we couldn't do the reveals the way that we wanted to do them. Uh, and we wound up racing each other a lot, uh, which that's all we could do. You know, uh, we had grandioso plans for a lot of our uh, our reveals, uh, but we just couldn't do it because COVID was rampant and it was killing people. And, uh, you know, we didn't want to be we wanted to be a part of uh, the solution, not part of the problem. But also it was a so supply chain issue. We had a real big problem right. trying to get parts just because of everything else that was going on. So our show really took longer to produce than, than anticipated, maybe almost double. So we're, we're a little late to the party, but we're, we're, we're here. Yeah. We're finally, we finally arrived. You know, so. it's, it's sometimes you gotta be fashionably late, right? Yep, yeah. Yeah. Try it. That's okay. You know, you, you guys did the whole Australia tour, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. let's talk about that for a second because that like i am obsessed with going to australia to ex to experience their motorsports culture just because from what i see from the outside what was it like for you guys there it's like a different it's like a different planet there right like it's uh it's uh, australia has found a way to adapt itself and its own you know restrictions uh to be able to do what we do there uh, on a on a very small scale, uh, you know, very small scale, considering the fact that Australia only only inhabits the edges of the the con you know of the country, and the and the middle is is desert and um, and Aborigines. But you go there, and the, the motorsports culture is 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 as heavy as anywhere right like here you got different variances different graduations of of, of fanatics it's full-blown fanatic there were on the plane ride there there were uh stewardess and uh people working on the plane that knew we were going to australia for the motorsports event right yeah and they were whispering in our ear you go into some of that <laughs> right <laughs> and so yeah. there, there was a huge buzz um you know, like there is among car guys, but I think that it was just a little bit more mm -hmm. than what it normally is over here because there's a lot of events over here and there's few uh, fewer car events in Australia. Mm -hmm. So the excitement of the people, uh, it was awesome, man. Uh, a very gracious people. Uh, it doesn't matter where you go or what you do. Uh, it's always the people that make the place. Um, you know, if you arrive in New York City and someone's mean to you, you hate New York City, right? But all the people there in, uh, not that I hate New York City, I love New York, but uh, everyone in Australia was awesome and they were very good to us. So we love Australia. Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they're going to scream right back, oi, oi, oi. Right, yeah, yeah, that's what they do. That's right. <laughs> that's exactly what they'll do. That's like we, we had some of them on the 10K drag shootout, the, those guys. And they were just – it's so hard to, like, describe their passion and how they do oh, things my God. there. It's like – it's a different – like, can-do attitude doesn't even begin to describe their cold culture or what guys War. Do. It's that's like right. you're going to war. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Like th they get their mindset. They're going to make something fast. They're going to find a way to do it. Or if like, they're like, you know, I want to put a blower on this tiny little car. All right, get out the cutting torch. We're going to make it happen. Yeah. And that's what they do there. Right. Yeah. And it's more difficult for them, I think, because there's a lot more restrictions and laws of what you can do and what you can't do to your car. Um, and uh, so it's more difficult for them, but they find a way, you know, uh, it's, it's, awesome people over there it, it always cracks me up when i see some of the videos down there of like legit nine second street cars with like guys with like lap belts from the 1960s no roll cage and no one saying a word it's like you know what this is how we roll here boys die like men <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's true it's like it's like watching Braveheart, you know, and, and William Wallace is walking back and forth trying to inspire his men before they go to battle. That's right. That's that's what it feels like well, in Australia. Yeah, yeah. That's, it. that's what it feels like. Everybody's just ready. You just tell them, you tell them go, and they're they're gonna attack. So the, they're true fanatics. You guys did the whole burnout competition down there. That that's a whole different world. What was that like? You know, I mean, we took we took 
America didn't know how to do burnouts until Australia was really doing them. And I, I wish America would have been able to pick that up and, and, and earlier than we did. Uh, but the style in which they did it, it's just more exciting. You know, we've b- done static burnouts, car crews, car show burnouts for decades here, but it doesn't match the way they do them. And it's kind of a hybrid version of drifting and sta- and, and, and static burnouts. Right. Um, and they, they go for popping the tires. Uh, they've made a competition out of it. Um, and you know, Hey, I saw it. I took something from it. Uh, I knew it was coming. Uh, I've been telling Telling everybody it's coming. Uh, there's been a few influencers that have really picked it up, um, and it's still coming. It's going to be one of the largest uh, motorsports uh, genres in the world um, very soon. That's Asian's prediction of burnouts, Australian style burnouts coming to America. Uh, it is not easy, um, as a lot of people saw whenever I got behind the wheel down there. Uh, the vehicle needs to be set up just right, just like in drag racing. And um, uh, if not, well, uh, you'll meet the wall. <laughs> and, <you laughs> or know, it'll just fall on its face. You know, that's the, the right. vehicle won't do a burnout if it's not you making know, enough power. We built that vehicle in two weeks and uh, um, it, it was kind of, you know, almost thrown together. You, you know what it's like to put something together that quick. Uh, but it was still an awesome opportunity and learning experience. And we've done a, a couple of Australian style burnouts here in the States uh, yep. at some of our events. Yep. And we're hoping to continue to do that. And we want people to get involved in it and start building cars that are specially built for burnouts. That's right. I mean, heck, just three years ago, we weren't even saying that word, right? Burnouts were just kind of a part of a car show. Right. That's right. Three years ago, no one was saying, hey, you're going to go to Cletus and Cars. Hey, you're going to go to Hoonigan's Barn Burner. Hey, you're going right. to three years ago. That didn't no one was talking about it. Right. But now it has to be a, a, a point of conversation every, every time now or it's just not avoidable. I love the fact you watch those videos and you'll see like legit pro mods like like the, their yeah. whole attitude down there is like, got a pro mod, mate. Yep. Throw it out on the skid pad. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yeah. Like, all I see is like, I'm like, that's a half a million dollars out there doing burnouts with an engine yeah. that costs yeah. God knows how much. I'm like, love it. I just, I love it. That, that whole yeah, attitude is awesome. Now, part of the fun you guys used to, you know, with the farm truck, it, you know, going out and kind of fishing and catching people. And it's, you know, unfortunately, it doesn't seem like it's as much of a, a sleeper as what it used to be because of the, the fame that has kind of come along with it, which, you know, it is what it is. But what are some of the better reactions you've got from people that might or might not have been on TV after the farm truck, you know, took them to Gapplebee's and got them the two for three special? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, long before the show, when the truck was just built and Asian and I, we go out fishing. Um that was the funnest that it ever was um, just because the truck didn't look like much. And um, it was always fun to go up against a motorcycle uh, and beat a motorcycle. Um, you know, we went up against a lot of bikes. Um, if it was um, a leader bike or bigger, we probably couldn't outrun it uh, depending on the rider. But if it was smaller than a leader bike, we pretty much had them. And uh, it was always a jaw dropper to them. Um, and uh, it, it was always fun to outrun a bike with a ratty old truck with the camper on it. So uh, that was always fun. And, and, and it was fun for us because every single time it would surprise us too. Right. That's Here's right. farm truck wheeling this thing. Right. He's just he's he's just put the 502 in it. And we're going out like, all right, well, who do we think we can beat? Right. And so we're picking on these people and we're beating them every single time. Right. And so we were, we're just cracking up every time we, we put So it wasn't ego. It, there was no ego involved with that. It was, in fact, almost the opposite. It was it was kind of the quintessential uh, opposite of trying to find the rich guy. Right. Trying to find the guy that that had all his ego and money tied up into it, no matter what it was. Let it be a Corvette or a or, or a, a, you know, an Italian supercar. Um, it, we just found that the 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 fast the bigger the ego the bigger the laughs for that's us. that's right so we just had a good time of, of seeing people people's soul leave their body <laughs> oh yeah yeah that, 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 that's a good way to describe it you know especially you get those guys with that ego that have you know you get a squid on a leader bike that thinks he can take anything and all of a sudden he's getting that's right 
getting drugged by a truck, you know, and that's, <laughs> I, I've but, seen that happen firsthand. It's always entertaining. You know, the, you know, all the supercars, you know, um, they're just under the belief that that's the fastest thing on the road. And uh, it, it, it's kind of been a goal of ours uh, to humble those guys, you know, not to make fun of them, uh, but, you know, um, it's the punchline, you know, you think you're going to get this and you get this. Those are the funniest jokes. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's the whole point. Don't take yourself too seriously. And this is a hard lesson in life of not to do that. Right. Like here's this dirty ratty old truck with a, with a, with, with a farmer and an Asian sitting inside of it, coming out to talk and you just got wore out by don't take yourself too seriously. That should be the wake up call. And then that's us laughing at the fact that they are taking themselves too seriously. So we're, we're a bit of a jester in, in, in that sense. You know, the way you just wore that, it made me realize something. If they ever make another Cannonball Run movie, you guys have to be in it. hundred <laughs> percent. Like, like that, that whole visual. I'm like, You're oh my right. God. It's like the Cannonball Run movies. Yeah. Yeah. It truly, that's what the John Candy, when he was in, you know, it's like that's right. everybody taking themselves way too seriously, right? Sign us up. Yeah. We'll do it. Yeah. Sign us up. I, I think we, you know, just let, let's float the script to someone in Hollywood right now. Just, you got to tell me, use the phrase I like to use. Listen, I got a bad idea that's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> and that usually could gauge really quick how much someone's going to be into something, right? You're, you're right, actually. That's a good point. I like yeah. that. It, it, it's funny. You, you, you talk about kind of catching people off guard and stuff like that. Again, I guess, you know, it, I've been around enough sleepers to know that when I see, you know, the proverbial shit box in the staging lanes, I'm like, I always give that car that extra hard look inside. I'm like, they're hiding something. They always got to be hiding something. Sure. Yeah, it's it's true. You know, and it, you know, hey, the, the the truck isn't as deceptive as it used to be, uh, but it's still a sleeper. It's still the definition of a sleeper. If you build a sleeper, the truck is still it. It's just a well known version of that, yeah. right? Uh, and so, yeah, we can't go out and 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 uh, really uh, trick people the way. But you'd be surprised how many people haven't watched the show. How many? Hey, if there's a, there's a guy with an expensive car, I promise you he d didn't spend his time in front of the television. He spent it behind a desk. He spent it uh, trading stocks. He spent it working and grinding to a fine powder until he bought the thing he wanted. And then a couple idiots come up and beat him. There, there's a big head fake there. So you'd be, you know, everyone would be surprised how many people ha don't watch television and how many people are successful by not watching television. Right. Right you know that that, that 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 could open up a whole nother can of worms but i 110 yeah. percent <laughs> agree with that it also makes me think that you know were you guys kind of like the uh you know where i went to college there was always this legend of this one fox body mustang that just <laughs> smashed people like if you saw this car it was like the red baron you knew like don't go the other way yeah Did you guys have that you know before the show before all the yeah you know, rewind it back was that part of like the legend of the farm truck like this this mythical creature stalking the the back roads of oklahoma we, well, th we think it, it was yeah we I, it became that um it, it did there was there was a couple really daddy dave was one of them right daddy dave was he had this white monte carlo and his buddy wiley had another monte carlo so these twin white monte carlos would go out those are the really fast cars but then the farm truck was the one coming up and beating everybody from the bottom and working his way to the top and uh i had a car club at the time called shifters and we had five or six guys and all of them had raced this truck with a and and we were i was like what truck and they were like, it's orange and white and it's running around and um I had my 64 Nova at the time that was hot rotted. And uh, I went out there, found him. We lined it up, didn't even meet each other. And sure enough, he, uh, he blew all four of my doors off and uh, <laughs> we, we pulled over and, you know, I probably was getting a little cocky, but he didn't have any of it. He, he, he made sure to show me how he made his truck better. He made his he, uh, farm truck, showed me how to make my car better. And from then on, you know, he really became my, my mentor. And so he became a legend and kind of the, the William Wallace of street racing, at least locally for me and uh became my mentor later on see that, that that's awesome to hear well, that thank you, know, you I, yeah you, you you hear those those legendary stories about these different vehicles and you know it, it kind of i think it helps build when you when you're part of something like that it helps kind of i'll say build your brain and how you do things is that something like kind of how you wanted to carry in a new show that you had your idea on how you wanted to do things and make it kind of legendary 
Uh, you mean in the truck sense? You mean in the yeah, like how you know the truck and how you know it was this thing, and is that something how you wanted to approach the new show? Was like, hey, we need to do something that's going to set it apart with the new show. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, we knew that the new show was going to be different, and it was going to be a build show, and we we had a lot of these ideas rolling around in our head about what we want to build, um, mm-hmm. and I don't think that will ever end. We still have a lot of ideas. Uh, We got eight episodes. We built eight different things. Um, So the build show is very different from uh, the original street outlaw show. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's kind of a hybrid of all these other car reality shows melded into one. Um, The one thing about our show is, is the fact that we're joking all the time, right? There's never a dull moment in in the sense of there's always going to be a comic relief. There's it's, it's full comic relief, the whole 40 minutes you're going to be watching it. But then there's also the fact that we, we took, you know, our talent pool, we brought them all together and we tried to figure these things, these vehicles out, but they had to work, you know, even in monster garage, they had to blow up a few. They didn't work. Right. Um, uh, Everybody has a couple stinkers that they put out, but every vehicle had to work. Uh, had to roll under its own power on our show. So that's that 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 was the point. Oh, you're, you're talking at my heartstrings with Monster Garage. That was one of my, I've, Jesse James is one of those people that, again, I, I hate, I, that's someone I look up to just because of his attitude and how he did things and how he calls it, how it is a Monster Garage. Like he just flat look at people and goes, that sucks. Like just, <laughs> and it's like, you know what, you know, if you've ever met Jesse, you know that like, you're not going to clap back at him. That, that, that might be a bad <laughs> yeah. choice. <laughs> yeah he's his own person he's always That's right been. yeah so you know and i guess you know do you guys have like a you know you've done you've done the show so far do you have like i have my own big board of i call it the big board of bad ideas if i ever had the opportunity to build vehicles in a certain way is, is do you guys have more in the tank for more ideas we do yeah that's that's unlimited really right like uh the only time that you're not going to have ideas to decide is the day you decide to quit. Right. Um, yeah. All of the ideas are bad. All, all <laughs> of them. Every single one of them. Well, they're bad. terrible because <laughs> most of the things that we build are heavy and big um, and um, not fast because they're big and heavy and they're not aerodynamic at all. But, you know, we've never claimed to be the fast guys at all. You know, the, the, the farm truck and dung beetle, they're not fast compared to most racers uh but they're enough for us and we kind of stay in our lane and uh, as long as we can drive them on the street we can go to sonic and get a coke uh roll the window down you know uh the vehicles are enough for us well our thing is we want vehicles that we have to explain to people right there's uh, you roll your camaro to the car show like oh what is it it's a camaro yeah. Uh, and that's the end of the story. Right. right. Well, what motor put you in it? Oh, it's an LS. Yeah. End of the story. Right. Uh, what transmission? Oh, that's a 4L60. End of the story. Right. Like, but if you build a farm boat, they're going to be like, what is that? right what what motor did how'd you put the motor what did you use for a propulsion system what what how you three but why not two but you who need- fell on their head and thought of that <laughs> yeah. right so we wanted we wanted with this new show we wanted to build vehicles that we could talk about that people could could look at it and not know what they're looking at so that's that was the the purpose and the point of of, of each of these builds is to build something so unique that someone would have to tilt their head and ask a question Oh, it, it's like the hearse I saw at PRI. Like I rounded the corner, I saw that. And like, it's one of those things that like the closer I got to it, the more I'm like, oh, oh, oh. And like, you just walk around that whole vehicle. I'm like, <laughs> That's right. like th- that was probably my, one of my top three coolest vehicles that was there just because of like, again, it's like, I hate to, it's going to sound terrible. It's like, you got into it like a teenager child's mind and like you create this vehicle that like, it, it's like tequila and firecrackers. It just speaks to men. You're like, yeah, <laughs> yeah <I'm fine. laughs> like, this is dangerous. I like yeah. it. You know, it, it's right there. well, uh, dangerous is a good word to describe that thing. Um, and it, it, it is one bad dude, but the whole idea, uh, the vision of that was, um, uh, we wanted it to look kind of like a time machine from 1958 uh, and that it was dug up out of a graveyard or left behind somewhere in a cemetery. And we got it and fixed it up and got it running. Uh, so when the hoods closed, you really can't tell 
um, you know, that, um, that it is a monster. Yeah. Uh, And even the hearse as by itself, if we would have stuck an LS in it, if we would have just put a regular, made it fast, made it kind of quick, it still would have been a conversation piece, right? Uh, As is with anybody that would build a hearse and make it fast. Um, And so, yeah, it's, it's that bait and switch, right? Like even back to the future, the the DeLorean, the DeLorean's what made the the movie, right? Uh, You probably already know the original stunt car, the original movie car was going to be a Ford Mustang, right? And then the writers said because ford was going to sponsor they were going to give them as many ford mustangs as they possibly wanted but the writer said doc brown brown doesn't drive a ford mustang he 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 has to drive something unique he has to drive something so so obnoxiously uh incorrect that 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 people will watch and continue so they made it a delorean and they used their own budget to buy the deloreans and ruin them wreck them and tear them apart as opposed to taking the money that ford was going to give them and that set the movie apart right it became the mascot for the movie all of our vehicles will become the mascot of each episode. Um, and, and hopefully it's enough to, to, to let people discuss it. And folks, you know, those watching, listen, go to dragzine.com and check out the story I did on this thing. So I, like Jeremy Wagler was there and I was like talking with him and I'm like, I looked at him, I looked at the engine, I'm like, is that what I think it is? You know, underneath the hood, he's like, yeah, it's one of our big gnarly deals. I'm like, this thing just gets cooler by the second. And like, just looking at the whole build, like if that's the T, you know, the farm boat, you know, that yeah, that's cool. But like that hearse right there, that tells me like, if that's the teaser of what we're going to see on this show, that's, that's going to be cool. Because that's, again, like you said, you could have, could have put, you know, a million and one different combinations in it, but who puts it basically takes a hearse and sticks it on a truck chassis. It's like, who does that? Yeah, yeah. Who, who does, does that? Does that? Does that? <laughs> it, it, that that's what makes it cool. And again, it, it takes it to the next level. Because yeah, you know, a hearse with a pro line, pro charge deal. Oh, that's loud and cool. But it, it is. Yeah, yeah. But it's not diesel cool. It's not all wheel drive cool. It's a different yeah. level. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the hearse is the most complicated build um, of of our season, um, and. Uh, because of the all wheel drive, because of, you know, the diesel um, and, you know, the gears trying to figure out all of that stuff. And, you know, plus it weighs uh, over 7,000 pounds. Uh, So it was a very difficult, uh, you know, most people hung up on us whenever we told them we were trying to go fast in a vehicle that was over 7,000 pounds. Uh, You know, how do you race something like that without breaking it every single pass Mm -hmm. uh well there's a lot of farm truck luck in there you Mm -hmm. know and uh we were able to get some of that done i think that that you know the go ahead car sorry i was gonna say they're they're giving you guys the number to like the the, you know defense contractors like these guys make tanks they might be able to help (laughs) (laughs) i know right that's right it's true yeah Yeah. Yeah. wagler's got you know government contracts what's he doing messing around right like so it's uh but it's that's that's i think the automotive industry needs more uniqueness it needs more courage it needs people to uh, hey you can chase cool cool is awesome man i love cool wheels i love a good looking paint job i do i love that i love going to see them and seeing what people can do with their talents uh but it's not what tells a story you don't go and tell someone, man, I saw a really cool, cool uh, a Nova. Oh, what color was it? It was it, it was red. Oh, OK, well, what motor was it? it was an L. There's nothing remarkable about it. It's cool. Uh, but cool ends the moment you leave. Um, and so no one walks around and she's like, man, that guy was really cool. You remember that cool guy I met five years ago? He's just really cool. Remember? Him? Yeah. Right. Remember that cool car? I saw it needs to be unique. The, the automotive industry is, is gaining traction on uniqueness, unique individuals building unique vehicles. And um, that's what it needs more of. Yeah. It, it, you know, it's, it's personalities, you know, yeah. a lot of times, like I'll find a cool car to write a feature about, you know, like you said, like a Nova, I found a cool Nova down at LS fest, but that was just the tip that that was the vessel to tell the story behind the car. And then you start like a lot of times you'll see these cars and you'll start looking and catching the details and stuff like that, that kind of set them apart. And that's what, you know, to me, it's, I always look at people like, tell me your story. What's the story behind this? And that's where you can find out the really interesting stuff. And it plays into what you just said. People like uniqueness. They like something that's different. They don't like a store-bought prepackaged deal. That's right. They want to be empowered. They want to be able to, people want to leave church with a story to tell. Right. They don't want to leave church with with with, you know, they want to leave words with the, the, the sermon needs to empower those people 
to be able to go home and tell their family, what, what did you learn in church? It needs to be remarkable. Whatever you say, do, or, 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 or construct, it needs to be somewhat remarkable or it's just for you. It's just for the ego. And that's fine too. Everybody's got their goals, but if you're trying to build something that, that the world can respond to, it needs to be remarkable. Oh, I, I love guys that do stuff like that go really fast, the hard way that just like, you know, Craig Sullivan with his mercury, it's like, of all the pro mods in the world, this dude built a 49 Mercury and it's, and he goes to, to the next level and puts, you know, like the, the, the low rider style wrap on this car and it's got a screw blower. I'm like, this is why other countries hate America at times, because we do stuff like this. <laughs> we, we, we look at convention. We're like, Oh, aerodynamics. Psh, we got a 49 Merc with a screw blower. This is what we're going to do. Yeah. You know, and, and that guy, um, I always say uh, to build something unique, you have to take the long way home every single time. Uh, and it's a lot more work and a lot more effort to go fast in something like that Mercury uh, than it is, uh, you know, a Camaro or a Mustang. Um, but, um, you know, the, the shock value, the entertainment value of looking at that old Merc go down the track is it's, it's what people remember. They bring those stories home and they tell their friends about the 49 Merc. Yeah. And, and I'm sure you, you guys are this way too. When you're at a car show and you see like a really cool, unique car, I'll go up and talk to this cat. Like, you know, you, you see the dudes that like build like old AMC stuff. That's not something you see all the time. I'm like, Yo, mm -hmm. tell me about this. You know, and you, you get to hear some really, really cool stories. Mm hmm. Yeah, you know, and I think that there's, you know, we, we go to some of those car shows and I think that some of those car guys confuse themselves, you know, they build this car for themselves, yet they take it to a car show and they got all these big, there's a lot of big egos at car shows, right? Like you'll go there and they don't want to talk to you. Like, Is this your car? Yeah. Why'd you build it? If you're not, if you're going to bring your car here and show it off for the rest of the people to see, don't you want to talk to those people? Don't you want to tell your story? We find a lot of people don't even want to tell their story. They just want to be cool. Right. So uh, we avoid those people, but the ones that have a story to tell and they, they they're, they're proud of what they did or, you know, it there was emotional value in it. Um, those are the ones we remember. And, you know, kind of looking at another thing, I want to change gears a little bit, you know, what we'll call what you guys do a job because it's, you know, what you got to sure. do to, to cool pay a job. It's a job. Yeah, it's a job. That's what people understand. What we do is a job. That's you know, right. Everybody's like, oh, you go to the racetrack all the time. But I'm like, it, it's a job. I got to put a lot of work into it. That's right. I, I know what my best part of my job is. What's the best part of what, what you guys do for a job? Oh, man, it's meeting. It's for us. It's meeting the, the different people. It's it's the it's the this has been such a big um, I don't know what to really it's been a big movement, the street outlaw movement. The, it's been a big, um, I don't know, hammer to be able to put us in places we wouldn't normally get into it. The opportunity that is presented for us, right, as carved paths that we're like, oh, we can go down this road. Hey, we can walk in here. Hey, we can do that. We can kind of begin to it, it's put this invisibility cloak on us as human beings and allowed us to kind of interject ourselves into people's lives, businesses, opportunities, organizations um, that we wouldn't have as the average Joe. And I feel bad for that, for the average Joe has to work, you know, four times as hard to try and just have a conversation with the person he wants to talk to. Uh, it's really given us uh, a blessing to be able to have, they're already interested in us. It has set the stage for them to ask us questions, to be able to say, yeah, hey, come in here, tell us your story. Um, so it's teed us up for opportunity. Yeah. And on, on my end, um, it's the kids. Um, if we can inspire uh, some kids to get out there and build something, you know, rather than uh, playing video games and, uh, you know, being on the internet uh, their whole life. Um, if we if, if we can get some kids to get out there and build some cool stuff, unique stuff, whatever, uh, that's the best part for, for me. I love uh, being able to do that and motivating. And there's been a lot of uh, fans that uh, have young fans that have brought their cars to us and wanted us to sign the dash. Uh, and that is just amazing that uh we didn't really help them do anything but we inspired them to get out there and work on something um, it's interesting because you don't realize you're a be you're a part of history like you, you look at it that way it's like that, that's got to be you know part of your job is like you're you're going to be immortal if you think about it with what you've done with the showing in the drag racing history and you don't like 
you don't, I guess, realize that because you're just, you're living in the moment, right? Now, you're, you're exactly right. And then when kids come up to us, I remember the first time that a kid came up to us and said, I grew up watching you <laughs> and we're looking at this young man, you know, and he grew up watching us. Oh yeah. We have been doing this for 10 years. I mean, yeah, it, it just took us by surprise. Yeah, he's 20 now. Yeah. Well, he was or, or 21. He was 11 when yeah. we first started watching. It's crazy for us to be able to kind of read. So you're right. Standing in the middle of, of the tornado, it's hard to imagine there's a tornado. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> that's right. It, it's your life, but it's a tornado. You don't realize yeah. it. And you're that's a good way to describe it. Right. You can't see the tornado if you're in the middle of it. So no. um, it, it, the cool thing that I also like I, I see a lot of is you know when, when fans and racers travel to places they'll take pictures where they go you know i'll see people take selfies in front of the freedom factory selfies mm -hmm. in front of other shops and i've seen them you know like they will put on their map hey i'm going to okc i'm going to go check you know where are these guys at i want to go see this that again that's got to be a cool part of the job is that you like you've inspired people to take that extra step out of if they're on vacation or on business that they want to come interact with you yeah, that, that's been cool. You know, we even do that. Hey, even before the show existed, um, we would we would go on road trips and go to racing events and we would stop at places that had been filmed, movie spots, sure. uh, prop prop locations. Uh, we even went by American Pickers and dropped by their location, right? And we kind of, you know, hey, we're, we're not oblivious to what we can begin to adopt and what what good practice, business practices we can put into place. And um, we saw what they did with that. And we said, hey, there's an opportunity here. We don't, we, people want to do this. They want to see what you've done. And if you don't give them nothing, what do they come see, right? Like we, so Farm had the idea, you know, and wouldn't it be cool if we had our own location, if we had our own place? So he kind of, he found this old firehouse, you know, and uh, not too far from where we live. And we started renting it. And, you know, hey, uh, so several years later down the road, we, we get the opportunity to buy it. And now we own it, right? And so having a hub for people to come see where we filmed, where we work on the vehicles, where we hang out. Um, I think that's important for It's them. fun for fans to get to stop in and see that, you know? Yeah, it, it, it's like a, it's like a backstage tour. You know, at Disney yeah. World, you know, that, that's the best way to describe it, except, you know, it's it's horsepower and fun. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. hundred percent. Now, the new show is getting ready to drop. And what was your favorite part about creating the content for this? Because, you know, for me, I've got my own things I like. It's my favorite part about creating certain kinds of content. What was like the the, the spark for you guys that made it just awesome to do? Well, the amazing thing is um, that we thought of these ideas and then we were able to bring them to life. Truly. You know, uh, it took a lot of hard work, um, you know, and uh, most people just see, uh, you know, the tip of the iceberg, the fun part, but they don't ever see what actually it took to get it done. But the amazing thing is, is that we can think of something, uh, put some time and effort into it. And all of a sudden this thing appears. Uh, with a lot of hard work um, it's that's my favorite part of it you know yeah I think I think farms right on the point with that it, it, we for eight eight episodes for eight different vehicles we we scientifically prove that your ideas can become reality right and you hear that Tony Rob go to a Tony Robbins conference go go yeah. to a TED talk right and they'll tell you all about it you can spend all your money on books and motivate but the fact is come up with an idea put all your effort into it and it will happen. It'll happen. It had to happen. We were, they paid us to do it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. But, but irregardless if someone's paying you or not paying you, or you got your own personal product, whatever you can think of, you can create with enough time and effort. You know, kind of going off of that, was there anything you guys came up with where the powers that be said, we're going to have to run this past legal? Well, oh, there was oh, a lot. Yeah, there was a couple. Lots of, of yeah, that. Yeah. And even though we ran, they ran it past, like we kept building it. <laughs> <laughs> we, man. We, we got, we got yelled at yeah. a lot. We're still getting yelled um, at. Yeah, that's right. But the, 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 we were telling them, Hey, the vehicle's already half built, you know? So, uh, and then they were like, all right, but can so, you make it slower? <laughs> yeah. We got yelled at for the nitrous chair, and, yeah. which was an accident. Yeah. You know, we yeah. didn't, I, I didn't mean to do that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Big mistake. They didn't want anything. The one rule was they didn't want anything to get airborne. That was the one <laughs> rule. <laughs> yeah. Oh. So that gave us great ideas. Yeah. You know? 
are are bad ideas. Yeah, that, that have yet to come come to fruition. <laughs> and, so, and that, and I can't imagine working a job where they say, "Now listen, you can't do anything that goes airborne." <laughs> like, that, was, <laughs> that was the only rule. That was really the only hard rule right. they gave us. We, even, even the military doesn't hear that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Like I said, that, it, it falls underneath the classification of sometimes it's better ask up for forgiveness than permission, right? That's, that's, that's right. kind of how we did it. Yeah, we knew we were never going to do anything wrong or put anybody's in harm's way intentionally. That was our job to put ourselves in harm's way, right? We were never going to put put anybody. I mean, accidents happen, but uh, for the most part, we felt relatively confident from the team we had that no one was going to get injured. And so they they trusted us and put some risk in, uh, in us this time. I, I can only imagine those meetings where they're like, they, they've, they've looked at prior cases or they're like, man, we, we, we need good content, but where do we put shackles on these guys? Like they're, they're trying to figure it out. Like they just go, let's just not have them fly anything. That will be the, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. it's true. Yeah. It's, and we have, we have, we've had plenty of phone calls where they're on the end of that and, and just really, we felt 16 years old, you know, a couple of times just because we've, we, we went too far with a couple. Yeah, ideas. I'm sure that if you ask them, uh, they would say that they weren't yelling at us, but <laughs> you know, when you're getting yelled at, and uh, reprimanded, <laughs> yeah. and uh, yeah, we felt like that uh, we were 16 years old a few times. Oh yeah, getting yelled at. <laughs> they're, they're looking at product requests for like jet engine. Absolutely not. <laughs> yeah, trust us, that was one of them. <laughs> well, we tried to buy one, and we wanted them to follow us to come film it, and they were like, "No way, no, we're not going to do that." <laughs> it was airborne again. It can't yeah. go airborne, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> Then you're just like, well, listen, we're, we're talking to this guy named Bob Moats has a jet truck. So we're going to promise it. If it goes airborne, something really bad has happened. And they're just yeah, like, <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's insurance to cover that. I'm sure they're just looking to like rewind that phrase a little bit. Let's let's wind it back in. But again, that that's part of the fun. And when you're trying to be a creative person and come up with this stuff, mm. honestly, sometimes we do need people to to reel us in a little bit because we come up with this tunnel vision idea. We're like, this is going to be great. And someone with some shred of common sense has to go, no, no, you're going to hurt yourself and other people. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah, yeah that is a good idea. But what if you die? <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> the, the ratings will get better. <laughs> Never thought about <laughs> that. The ratings. But Dying. that's, you know, I mean, we're, <laughs> you, even then we're like, I know you don't, we don't, we don't think about that. We don't think about that being the end goal, right? Like, oh, what if you die? Well, what if I do? Right. Like I was having a great time before it stopped. <laughs> right. Like, so it's, uh, I mean, why do you go skydiving? Because you might die. Right. You don't, if you were guaranteed not to die, no one would go skydiving. Right. <laughs> there would be no, you, you want a little tiny 0.01% chance of death. You do. You want that. Everybody has different levels of what they will have is what we'll call acceptable sketchiness. Some people have a very low end of it yeah. some of us have a higher end of it and like yeah. i look at it, as long as i've got good safety gear and something looks like it's probably going to be okay yeah you know you only live once give it a shot what's yeah, the worst thing yeah. happen sometimes twice hey if, you, if you're a buddhist you come back right <laughs> <laughs> so yeah and, I, and i'm sure is you know kind of off of that same deal another question i just thought of here has there ever been any point to your guys's adventures where you looked at either, you know, we've all been to racetracks. You're like, oh, this is kind of sketch. Is there anybody a point where you've kind of taken pause for a second and gone, maybe we need to, to look at this again? Oh, well, there's been some demolition derbies. There's been some dirt track races um, that we have been like, okay, that was a good time once, right? Uh, where we kind of got outside of our wheelhouse a little too much, maybe. Um, or, or we involved people that, that had their egos out a little too much. Um, it's always when the egos get in front of the intent that you have problems. I could only imagine. Yeah, that, that, that's a great way to paint that picture. And, and again, it, it comes down, you talk to someone like Frankie Taylor that went damn near 300 miles an hour in a door car. He said, that was really fun to do one time. I'm not doing that again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you get one opportunity and, and you're like, all right, yeah, that, that, that's for the books. Definitely. Now, I always like to throw at least one fun question at my guests. And, you know, I've done time machines, unlimited bank oh. accounts, oh. control of the drag racing universe. For you guys, you have an unlimited bus budget, all the money in the world. You have access to go to any shop you want to go to. 
you're going to run, build something to run to the top of the list. What are you going to build and who's going to build it? You know, anything in the world. It's hypothetical, just dream question. Dr- yeah, this is that dream question when you're driving home from the race at three o'clock in the morning and you got to make sure you don't drive your rig off the road and you okay. thought of this scenario. What well, two, two, it's kind of a two part for, for the, the realistic is we probably would never do that being farm truck and Asian who we are, but let's just pretend, right? Like, and so there's some local guys that build some pretty fast cars. We build a truck. Yeah, we build a truck. Uh, we might bring in Don Dial. You know, he's a local guy. Uh, Alex Taylor, Dennis Taylor, they build some fast cars, right? Uh, we might take something to their shop. Our first choice would be uh, Oklahoma people, since we're from Oklahoma. Yeah. We always like to include uh, our Oklahoma family mm-hmm. uh, in anything that we do. Um, that would be first and foremost. Yep. Uh, but, hey, you know, we would have – our style is we would bring everybody together. We'd have a, a, a meeting with Ryan Martin. That's you know, right. We'd have sure. a meeting with Murder Nova. We'd have a meeting with Chief and say, hey, guys, this is this is what we want to do. Um, and, and at the end of the day, I think we'd still mess that up. I think we'd still, I think we'd still mess that up, man. So yeah, we probably would. Even hype, we still have to put our cell, our own personality still into it, right? Like even our own once and dreams, the unlimited budget, unlimited shop, we would still mess that up. I promise you we would. We would put a billion dollars into a car and it would just be the most uncool uh hairball sketchiest thing you'd ever drive but it'd be the fastest thing in the world (laughs) that no one would drive i just want to see you guys build a pro mod like version of the farm truck like a pro mod no prep truck i'm in my mind that's what i think that you would try to be going for like you said to go off the rails a little bit it would be this streamlined c10 is what it's supposed to be but i gotcha that'd be cool That'd be cool. You know, uh, get a chip foose involved, you know, to have them sketch it out. There's been a lot of talk about that. Um, But uh, just to, um, it takes so much time to invest into a race car like that. Uh, And it would, it would consume all of our time. And uh, we're also not smart enough to go that fast. (laughs) We're not, we're not, not. it's true. Right. So it always, it always kind of comes back. It it takes a whole team of people to do that, you know, and uh, the, the, the uh, Asian and I, we're just not, uh, I don't think we're cut out for that, but we'd give it a go and it'd be a beautiful disaster. (laughs) (laughs) So what you're saying is the entertainment factor would be through the roof. The fast factor, maybe not so much, but that's right. You'd have a lot of fun making a lot of noise, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. You give us the checkbook and we're going to have a good time. Yeah. It, I, I, I think if we did that, it would be no different from the way the list was and the farm truck and dung beetle trying to get on the list. Uh, you know, we, we got our asses kicked, you know? Um, and every time those guys race, they get more experience, mm-hmm. you know, it would be like that if the, if the street outlaws went up against the NHRA right now, uh, they would probably get their butts kicked um, because of the experience in that world. And we don't have the experience in their world. Yeah. And it's crazy to think about, like, we would have to have that motivation. Something would have to, something would have to click with us that made us believe we could do it because, you know, I, even today I was driving here and I was thinking, I was thinking about Ryan Martin, right. I was just thinking about his race program, what he's done, what he's accomplished. Um, and it's impressive considering the fact that he came in halfway through street outlaw season. We're already three, three, three years deep, four years deep in it. He comes in and smashes and crushes and just turns us all into a fine powder. And he's still doing it with MPK. He's doing it anywhere he wants to do it with small town club races. How does he do it? Is Okay. Well, you could say, well, he's got a pro line motor. He's got, it. well, so does daddy Dave. Well, he's a good driver. So is daddy Dave. Well, he's a good tuner. Well, so is chief. Right. So what is the magic? We don't know. We don't, I don't, I have no clue. And no one has done what Ryan Martin has done. There's a lot of people that have tried to beat him once um, or twice. Liz Musi's captured some, some of it. What's that magic, man. And it's not the money because all these other guys have resources. Sure. Um, they're, they're skilled. They're talented. What has Ryan Martin unlocked? that he's been able, I don't know. So to build something unlimited budget with as much skill and talent, you're still not going to beat the outlier. You're not. And Ryan Martin's an outlier and you have to remove him from the equation. You know what I'm saying? You have to remove the bottom, which is us. We're the, we're the bottom outlier. And then you have to remove Ryan Martin, who's the top outlier. Right. And then somewhere in the middle, maybe we could hit. (laughs) 
<laughs> never thought of it that way. That's it. <laughs> right. Right. So, but at the same time, I enjoy the answer to the fact that you guys are 100% Oz. You're like, listen, doesn't matter what we're going to build. It's still going to be, you know, a circus. We ain't going to be, we ain't going to be Ryan Mark, but we'll lie through our teeth and tell him we are. <laughs> and you'll have a Ryan good, don't know that. Yeah. <laughs> and you'll have a good time doing it, right? That's, That's right. That's right. right. Well, guys, our time here is coming to the end. And I like to give my guests their opportunity to kind of channel, channel their inner John Force and thank all their sponsors and thank whoever they need to thank and, you know, go off, you know, so. I turn the show over to you, my friends, you know, thank you. You need to thank, tell people where they can find you out, what you got going on a whole lot sure. more. So take it away. Hey, Discovery Channel, January 10th. It'll be Street Outlaws, Farm Truck and Asian. We'll be trailing the OG Outlaw show uh, coming in. So it's going to be important. Uh, we, we obviously need to thank Discovery Channel, Pilgrim Studios for putting this thing on. It's the funnel to be able to thank all the sponsors that did help us. We thank uh, guys like you, Brian, for being able to put us on your show, uh, give our message, tell, t- tell the world what we're about, what's about to happen. Um, so we thank every single one of you that put effort into telling somebody else's story. You know, it's been great to have you guys on the show. I, I knew it would be a lot of fun because you were definitely not wallflowers and the stories <laughs> flowed. A fun time was had by all. And uh, hopefully I'll, uh, I'll see you guys out on the road this year. Kick ass. We'll see you again soon, man. All right. We'll see you out there. Thank you. Thanks, Brian.